invite you to stand as and join us as we start off our together before the throne. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Tongue can bid me thence depart. 
going to lead us this morning in our call to confession. As we enter into a time of confession together, let's prepare our hearts by hearing these words from Luke 18. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Please turn to the screens and read along or contemplate these words as we pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, your name is love, so in love receive our prayers. Our sin is real and hard and heartbreaking, and it abounds even when we try to control it on our own. But where sin abounds, so your grace is even more abundant. Forgive us for the ways we try to hold it and manage it on our own instead of come to you. Help us to know you are a safe place, that you've called us your own, and offer us the kind of comfort we can only find in you. When we wander and rebel, Draw us back time and time again to marvel at your endless patience and undying love. Your grace rushes toward us like a mighty river from heaven. Help us turn toward it confidently. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the scriptures, we find assurances of our forgiveness and encouragement in our walk. So hear these words from Ephesians 2 and rest in their truth for us. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one 
and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access into one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now please turn your attention to the screens for our life at adventure. Good morning, Adventure family. Welcome to Life at Adventure. We have a guest this morning, Tony Chris, who is going to share the message with us. And after spending the weekend with him and his wife, Amy, at our staff retreat, we are really grateful for the opportunity for him to share more with us this morning. I'd also like to say thank you on behalf of our staff for your prayers this weekend as we came together for our retreat. Okay, let's jump into some announcements. Just because base camp is over for its typical rhythm does not mean the fun and fellowship has to end. We hope you will join us at the playground for some base camp summer hangouts every couple of weeks. Everyone is welcome. This is just an opportunity to continue breaking bread together and being together, connecting, building relationships, practicing having some faith-based conversations. Um, we just hope you'll join us. Our first one is this Wednesday, June 26th from 5.45 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Bring your dinner and we'll see you there. I got to share last week that our summer Sabbath is coming up in just a couple of weeks for the month of July. This is a month where we take some time to pause from our typical rhythms and reorient our hearts and minds on the Lord through rest in Him. And it's an opportunity this year we are taking to focus on practicing joy as well. We will have resources available to prompt for uh, ways for us all to engage this practice. And we also have a few low pressure events where we can practice just being together with this adventure family. I wanna talk about the first one. It's after church on Sunday, July 7th. It's just a family potluck barbecue. We're gonna be grilling burgers, turkey burgers, and hot dogs after church. And we'll provide those and condiments and buns. As you are able, please bring a side or dessert to share. Um, and so we can get an idea of who's coming, we'd appreciate if you can sign up on the clipboards going around service today. But, but also, please don't hesitate to just jump in last minute if you can. We call this the Bucket Barbecue because, well, long ago it used to be the One Buck Barbecue, then it was the Two Buck Barbecue, and, and instead of pushing our current $3 suggested donation per person, just add a few bucks as you feel led uh, in the buckets to help cover the cost of the food. We're looking forward to this uh, first summer Sabbath opportunity. Um, so if you want to jump in and grill or just be with us, uh, we hope to see you there. And then don't forget to register for the Adventure Family Campout uh, coming up on July 12th through the 14th and mark your calendars for VBS at the end of July from Friday the 26th through our Sunday VBS takeover on July 28th. As always, for all the details and registrations of all of these things and more, make sure you are checking out our weekly newsletter or asking at the Welcome Center. So with that, whether you are in the Worship Center, live with us online, or later on YouTube or the app, we are just so glad that you've chosen to join us in worship today. Yes, thank you for joining us in worship today. Um, if you'd like to stand and join us as you're able, we are going to continue in worship with one more song before the sermon. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. My gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my 
joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I before you this morning in awe and gratitude that we get to be together and worship you. 
Lord, I pray this morning that you would just open our hearts and our minds and our spirits, Lord, before you. I pray that you would give us just the ability to be present with one another and with what you have for us today. Lord, as we move into this time of the message, I pray that you would just um, speak to us, speak to us loudly, that yours would be the only voice, Lord. Lord, we thank you for Tony that he gets to share this morning. We're so excited um, and grateful. Lord, I pray that you would just give him the wisdom and clarity that he needs this morning to share what you've put on his heart to share with us. Lord, we thank you for all the ways that you are continually working to grow us closer to you, closer to each other. And Lord, I just, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so The Usual Suspects is this movie where a boat burns down and only two people escape. One guy named Verbal and this other guy who's in the hospital and yelling about another guy named Kaiser Soze. A detective calls in a sketch artist to draw Kaiser Soze based on the description from the guy in the hospital. Meanwhile, Detective Kujan is interviewing Verbal, who's not very nice, and Verbal starts to tell Kujan this really long story about how Verbal ended up meeting some pretty bad dudes and they decided to do some bad dude stuff together like steal a bunch of things. Well, while they were hanging out, they heard about this guy named Kaiser Sose, who is a super bad dude, and all the regular bad dudes are scared of him, and he's kind of a legend, but in a bad way. Well, a representative from Kaiser Sose approaches Verbal and his friends and offers them a lot of money to commit crimes on this boat. Verbal and his friends are so scared of Kaiser Sose that they agree to do it. As Verbal tells his story, Kujan thinks he knows who Kaiser Sose is, one of Verbal's friends. Kujan sends Verbal away and is looking around his office and realizes that Verbal's story included a lot of details from things in the office, and Kujan starts freaking out because he realizes Verbal made up most of the story about his friends. Then, the sketch based on the description from the other survivors starts coming through the fax machine, and Kujan looks down, and plot twist, it looks exactly like Verbal. We see Verbal walk out the door and get in a car with a representative of Kaiser Soze, and it turns out that Verbal was Kaiser Soze the whole time. I, uh, I apologize if we ruined a movie for you by giving you the ending, but that movie came out a long time ago, and it's on you, so I don't, I don't really apologize. Well, today it's, it's really exciting. I was telling somebody this morning that it's, I'm excited because I get to introduce to people I love somebody that I love, somebody that's honestly helped craft my um, understanding of God and my understanding of seeking to follow him in a real significant way. Um, I've talked about in here before that... Um, when I was 17, I read a book by Henry Rollins um, that changed how I read the Bible um, significantly, um, even though he's not a Christian. Um, what I haven't shared about is another book that I read um, that Tony Criss wrote that in my seminary days that also changed the way that I read the Bible and follow God and encouraged me to, to chase him with imagination and wonder. And uh, it's so exciting to be able to have him here today. Tony Criss is a uh, missionary. He's a seminary professor. He uh, is one of the founding members of New Wine, New Wineskins, which is the organization that I'm affiliated with. And um, Paul Metzger, if you know Paul, uh, is the, the head of. Um, he speaks regularly. He's written several books. In fact, some of, a couple of his books will be available at the Welcome Center afterwards if you'd like to check them out. Um, but he's going to come in and he's just going to continue on in our Acts story by reading or sharing with us um, the story of Peter's vision. So uh, if you could, please welcome my friend Tony. Good morning. Okay. Um, I, I grew up in church. I grew up, uh, church was the one place where I felt at home growing up. I was an awkward kid. I was a scrawny kid. I was bad at everything. I was five foot two, 100 pounds until my junior year of high school. Went to a big high school, so... It's hard for me to find places to succeed, but man, did I love church. I was good at church. I was good at Bible drills, 
and verse memorization. And um, I loved going to my big, my big brick church downtown in, in Eugene, Oregon, where I grew up. In my church, um, I always knew, I don't know how I knew this, uh, I don't think anyone ever said it directly, but I was very sure of it from my youngest days that my church was the best church. <laughs> and there was no question about it. If the church is a dartboard, my church was clearly the bullseye the center of God's will, and the other churches around our town, well, I knew what was wrong with all of them. <laughs> I knew how they were not the center of the bullseye, and I knew that some of those churches probably weren't on the dartboard at all. How I learned these things, I don't know, but if you had asked me about any other church in my town, I could have told you, ours is the best, and here's why theirs, their churches are not as good. It's just part of the way that I was raised. It's interesting that um, this ability of religion to invalidate others and to build systems where we're so comfortable with it, it never, I never even questioned the fact that that was a bad way of thinking. I actually thought I was raised to believe that I was a better Christian because I could articulate the ways that the other churches were not as good. That was one of the ways I showed that I loved God. Uh, CJ mentioned that I'm a missionary. I'm not a missionary. I haven't been a missionary for 30 years now, but uh, 20, 20 years now. But in my young, in my young adult life, uh, I grew up in church, and then I went to a state school, and um, I had some great faith experiences. And when I graduated from university, I was 21 years old, and three and a half weeks after I graduated, I climbed on a plane and I flew to one of the mo most mysterious corners of the planet, and I lived there. That mysterious corner back in 1992, you can do the math, um, that mysterious corner was a country called Albania, and at that point it had just come out of communism. It had just come out of 50 years of what some people said was the most barbaric form of communism on the planet. Worse than Russia, worse than Cuba, um, very, very controlling. And when I got to Albania, the, uh, the country, had 50 years had been closed, no Westerners had been inside. And over those 50 years, uh, they said that one in three people had spent some time in prison for things like being caught with a Bible or for even suggesting that maybe there was a problem with the government. When I got there, there were no, there were no cars in the streets of the capital only horse-drawn wagons, herds of sheep walking through the capital. I would walk an hour each way to go to the university to do, to do missions work with college students. And that first year, about six months into my time, my, my first Albanian friend, a young man named Eugen Karanza, who was from a southern city called Korcha, he pulled me aside and he said, hey, Easter's coming up and I would love for you to come to my village. Before communism, he said, my village was an Eastern Orthodox village, a Christian village. And, um, and I would love for you to come to my village for Easter and to be with my family for Pashka, Easter. And I was like, that sounds fantastic. So, uh, so I, I meet Genny on Friday after school and we meet down and we find a microbus and we, buy tickets and we get in this little microbus and it takes off into the mountains of Albania. Albania is a very mountainous country and as I'm riding in this thing, there, are, there aren't even pads left. The, the bus is so old that the pads have rotted off. So I'm sitting on like a metal, like just, just the metal scaffolding that used to be a bench, right? I'm sitting on that and between my feet is a hole in the, in the metal so I can watch the, the, the highway go by underneath my seat as we're riding over the mountains on highways that have not been repaired in probably decades. Took hours. We had to go over two or three mountain ranges to get there, but we pull into Korcha and 
We get off, we go and we find, we go to, to, to Genny's flat and I meet his family, it's fantastic. His mom just cooks all weekend. We just eat and eat in this little tiny, kind of Soviet looking apartment flat. And um, the next day is Saturday and we kind of hang out all day and eat and eat and eat and eat. We have dinner and then we're lounging, stomachs full in the living room. We're playing backgammon. It gets to be late evening. The sun has been down for a while, a couple of hours. And I'm just hanging out, kind of, kind of waiting to go to sleep. It's Saturday. And all of a sudden, Genny grabs me and goes, we got to go. And I'm like, go where? We have to go. It's Easter. And I was like, it's Saturday. <laughs> I've been doing this for a little while now, and it's not Easter. He's like, no, we have to go. It's Easter. So he grabs me and grabs my jacket, and we, we run down the stairs out of the apartment building, and we run where the concrete turns into cobblestones, and we're running across the cobblestones in downtown of this little tiny city up in the mountains of southern Albania. We're running across the cobblestones, and I'm like, where are we going? And it's dark, and... And we come to where the cobblestones end and it's just dirt. And foothills heading up into the mountains. And I stop and he's like, come on, it's Easter. And he grabs me by the arm and he pulls me, he's pulling me up the hill and I'm like, all right. You know, I'm scrambling up the hill. I'm like, I'm not a mountain man. I'm not used to this stuff, but you know, <laughs> we're scrambling up the hill and we start to go half hour, hour, hour and a half up up, up, one foothill turns into another foothill, turns into a mountainside. Little groups of children are like running past me, like up the mountain. I'm like, what is going on? We're coming along up upon these little, like little old ladies all hunched over in their black outfits and trying to climb over rocks as they work their way up this mountain. They've probably been trying to get up for since midday and we're helping them, you know, around the rocks and over and up the mountain and up and up and up we go. And eventually we come over the crest and all of a sudden there's this plateau laid out in front of us, the size of several football fields up on top of the world, under the moon. And in the middle of this plateau, right in the middle, is this little stone church. I'd been in Albania for six months. I had never seen a church in Albania. The communist government had scraped all of them clean, had gone through every city and every village and just removed them from the face. They wanted no evidence in the country that belief in Jesus existed. And here, in the middle of nowhere, on top of the world, was this little stone church. So again, he grabs me by the arm. He's like, come on, it's Easter. So we scramble across this, this big plateau and there's other people coming up the other sides onto the plateau from different villages. And it's like, where am I? This is wild. So we scramble across this. He pulls me around the side and I'm dragging my fingers along the stones and the moss as we come around to a little entrance. And again, he ducks inside and then I go inside and I get in there in the darkness and it's a room that can only hold maybe a dozen people inside this little tiny church, this little chapel. And on one side of the room is an altar with some candles and a, a few soot covered icons and these peasants are sitting in there and they're lighting candles and I'm in the space and you know, the average Albanian peasant is like five foot nothing, so I look like a, like a cave troll, you know, inside the space. So, like, I, I back up into the, into the shadows, and I put my shoulder blades against the stone. And I just stand there, and I just watch the scene. I was only 22 and just dumb. And I'm watching this thing. I'd never, I'd never imagined I would see anything like this. And as I think back to that boy in the darkness, watching these peasants, 
light candles, some of them knew to cross themselves, others didn't know what that was. I imagine what, I try to remember what I was thinking. For some of these people, this was probably the first time they had ever stepped inside of a church. And I remember, th- I remember wondering whether or not they were real Christians. I mean, there was no, there was no altar. I mean, I mean, there was no like stage. There was no podium. There was no baptismal. There's no pastor that I could see. And I wondered, like, could these people even, I mean, what do they know? What do they know? How could they, is this, is this thing they're doing even real? You guys are doing this, um, this Acts series, and I was invited to speak on Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 23. If you're of the ilk that you like to read along, um, Acts 10, verse 9. Peter is, my, uh, is probably my favorite character in the Bible. Or I should say, he may not be my favorite. He's the one I relate to the most. So in that sense, he might be my least favorite. Uh, I relate to his um, stumbling into scenes. I relate to his saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. I relate to him... being even today, 2,000 years later, sort of the cautionary tale of faith so many times. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll just, maybe I could talk about it a little bit with you. Acts chapter 9, or Acts chapter 10, verse 9. Peter's in Joppa. He's hanging out with a tanner named Simon. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, these are the they in this um, verse are the servants from Cornelius the centurion. On the next day, while they, the servants, were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, that would be noon, to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he, Peter, saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has created no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed, perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether, si- they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. This is our passage today. Okay, let's start out here. Verse 9. 
On the next day, the servants were on their way and approached the city. Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, noon, to pray. But he became hungry and desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. Okay. So what is going on with Peter in this moment? First of all, he's going up on the roof to pray at noon. Heat of the day. Jews usually pray in the morning and the evening. Praying at noon is not part of the tradition. We can imply that this was an unusual act by Peter, or Luke wouldn't point it out. Luke wouldn't point it out if it was just something he did all the time, but he's like, on this day, he went up at noon to pray. So something's going on inside Peter's brain. Now, Luke, the writer of Acts, I think he gives us some clues as to what's going on inside Peter's brain. It's helpful for me to be reminded from time to time that the chapter numbers, the chapter breaks in my Bible, were not there when Luke wrote this. Luke was writing a story. He was writing a history. And what we consider chapters and verses probably never occurred to Luke. This was just one document. This was one long scroll where what we consider one chapter just flowed directly into another. And I would think that this story, this particular part of the story, is actually several chapters long, what we call chapters. And I imagine Peter went up to pray and based on the order that Luke gives this to us, I think Peter probably was like, Lord, I'm having a tough couple weeks, and I need to talk to you about a few things. I hope that's all right. We've got a good thing going in Jerusalem, Lord. Pretty excited about it. You know, that whole Pentecost thing threw us off balance a bit, but we sort of, we got our stuff together and got our legs under ourselves, and stuff's been moving pretty well, Lord. I want to thank you for that. We got a lot of house churches starting and people are doing a great job. We're, uh, we're breaking bread together and we're praying for each other. We're even seeing some healings. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm very excited about it. And um, I really wish we could just kind of keep this thing in Jerusalem where we got it under control. Things are moving. Yeah, there's a little persecution on the side, but mostly super excited about it. But Lord, you've been, you've been messing with my head a little bit lately. Philip got a little big for his britches, went up to Samaria, started preaching to some people, and it seems suddenly Samaritans, these half-breeds, they think they're part of the way. And I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that, Lord. So I ran up there to double-check on it, and sure enough, there's all these people been baptized. All I could do is just pray for them, and next thing I know, your Holy Spirit's blessing them and, and proclaiming that they're actually part of the way. Lord, that was hard on me. I just have to admit it. I wasn't prepared for the half-breeds to be involved, but oh well. We'll do our best. And then, Lord, that, that, that crazy Philip ran off to talk to the Ethiopians. He's, he's seriously jumping off the plan, Lord. I, I was carefully orchestrating this thing, you know, the whole Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and suddenly you're running off to Ethiopia, Lord. I'm not sure what to do about that, but God, I'm going to trust you with it. Just don't ask me to go to Africa. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. And then, Lord, it seems that uh, Saul, of all people, the great persecutor, my arch enemy, rumor has it you've gone and saved him. What am I supposed to do with that, Lord? He's literally the worst guy on the planet, and you've decided he's part of your plan. I'm a little uncomfortable, Lord. I'm a little uncomfortable, I have to admit. And then a couple messengers come and grab me and they drag me to this city, Joppa, as I sit here on the roof and I look out over this garrison city, this Roman city, the city of Joppa, with high stone walls where Romans live. And I sit here on this roof at Simon the Tanner's house. And I look over the village and you bring me here and what do I find? I find dozens and dozens and dozens of Romans who have been ministered to by this woman, a woman lord, named Dorcas, of all things. 
And she's been ministering, it seems, for years and years, doing acts of kindness and compassion. And the whole city loves her so much that there was a vigil when they thought she was dead because she had done so much work without the permission of the apostles, might I add. This disciple Dorcas just decides to run out and minister to Gentiles with no one's permission that I know of. I'm a little confused. Can you feel his pain? His world is unraveling. So, um, but while they were making preparations for his lunch, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky open up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord. I think it's interesting that Luke says it's a voice. Later in the passage, he says it's the spirit. But this one, Luke's like, it's just a voice. But Peter seems unconfused. He calls the voice Lord. My sheep will hear my voice and they will know me. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, by no means, Lord. Now, uh, by no means is actually a fairly polite way of saying, I don't want to. It's not the rebellious, I won't do it. It's, Lord, I don't really want to. By no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Peter is... Um, I think Peter's already struggling as I've expressed. And the Lord comes to him with what now, 2,000 years later, we know is a metaphor, that the animals on the sheet are the nations. We know this. But in the midst of the moment, Peter's being asked to do something that in a lifetime of screwing up and putting his foot in his mouth and denying the Lord three times and all the things, He's being asked to do one of the things he's actually done well in his life. He actually has kept the dietary laws. And suddenly he's being asked to break his streak. And he doesn't want to. This is part of his resume. Mary Ann earlier read the story from Luke 18 where the Pharisees like, Lord, thank goodness I'm not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. The Pharisee, that's one of his things he wants to hold on to. I fast twice a week, and he declares it as if that kind of covers him for everything else in his life. Don't we do the same thing? We have certain behaviors that we elevate, and they just happen to be the behaviors that we're particularly good at. And we use those behaviors to judge everyone else because when we use that as a measuring stick, we're on top, and that feels pretty good. And Peter's being asked to reconsider one of his measuring sticks that he's actually done pretty well on. I'm sure the Lord's a little frustrated in this moment because all the way back in Mark chapter 7, Jesus has declared, it's not that what goes into the body that defiles a person, for what goes into the body just goes into their stomach and out the other side. But it's what comes out of a person that defiles them, that the things that come from their heart, their evil thoughts, their foolishness, their judgmentalism is the thing that defiles them. This was all the way back in Mark chapter 7. And here we are in Acts chapter 10, and the Lord's bringing the same idea up and going, I, I told you this back in Mark chapter 7, Peter. 
And it's a metaphor anyway. Wake up. I'm trying to show you something. And three times, Peter says, I will never eat anything unclean. It's like he's going, not going to screw up this time, Lord. I'm going to hold my ground. Don't let that cock crow. I'm going to hold my ground on this one. And the Lord's like, patiently, comes back three times. Don't call these things unclean. Don't call the nations unclean, is the metaphor. But Peter can't see it. Verse 17. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, might be behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. Okay, so why, why is Peter perplexed? I'm going to try and share an idea. Peter is suffering from what I would call a membrane mentality. Let me try and explain this. And maybe my metaphor won't work, but we're going to try. Peter had set up the world in his mind around those who were in God's plan and those who were out of God's plan. And for him, the ones that were in God's plan, they existed inside Jerusalem. It wasn't everybody, but there was definitely a membrane around Jerusalem that you have to be sort of inside this thing in order to be one of the people. And then over these last few chapters, that membrane has been pushed out to Judea, and he's kind of like, well, okay, I'll expand the membrane a little bit. And the Samaria, I'll expand the membrane a little bit. But this is it. This is as far as I'm going to go. This is where, inside here is where God's plan is happening, where God's people are coming from. And outside of that, people cannot come from. Does that make sense? And it's very hard for him to let go of that containment system because he could get his brain around that. He could conceive it. On some level, he could control it or at least be a participant in his mind in the story. I can remember, um, I'd been overseas for 10 years as a missionary. I came back eight years, to be honest, eight years. And I came back and I was really burnt out. Um, I, I shared with the church staff yesterday that I, I, the end of my time overseas was really hard, really painful time for me. Really burnt out, um, kind of became the worst version of myself. I came home. And I was asked if I wanted to go to New York City for the summer to just sort of be a mentor in this like mentoring project in the city in New York for the summer. I was like, God, that sounds like fun. So I go to New York and I have this really sweet job where I'm mentoring some college students and then they're all working in these like nonprofits and shelters and stuff around the city. And I just got to go like hang out, and, like be with all these great kids in the city and I'm living in Manhattan and it's great, great. And uh, one of my first days there, I go, I go down to the Bowery and I go into this homeless shelter. And um, I'm really nervous because I, I, for all the places in the world I've been, I haven't really spent much time around the sort of unhoused that we have here in America. And so um, I was a little nervous walking in and it's New York City, which is kind of a scary city. And I remember walking in and after a while I get asked, you know, is there anything I can do? Can I help like dish up plates or whatever? And the guy's like, no, just go get a plate for yourself and go sit down and just make friends with people. So I dish up my plate, and I remember I'm walking through the dining room, and you know the tables are full of folks, and I'm feeling nervous, and I'm walking through. Back in the back corner in the shadows is this big 300, 340-pound African-American man, bald, considerably older than me, sitting in the corner. He sees me, and he goes, So I go back, sit down, says his name's Harry, hi, I'm Tony. We start to chat, it doesn't take long at all, and we're friends. We're chatting away, a million miles an hour. He's amazing. I mean, he loves the Lord, it's clear. 
He's sharing with me stories about how he ended up on the streets and his addiction and how he's trusting the Lord to overcome it. And he's so scared. And he's so tense. talks about it. And I've, I mean, he's being so honest. Well, I'm sharing with him about my hard things that happened overseas. And he's like speaking into my life and like, like being like the voice of God to me, you know, like, like, like a balm to my soul. And then he would... And then he would do that, and then he would like change gears, and the next thing you know, he'd be talking about Hollywood personalities who are his personal friends. He'd be like, oh man, Larry Fishburne, boy, old Larry and I, I never forget what Larry told me about blah, 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 blah. Old Marty Sheen, boy, old Marty, I love Marty. Marty once told me, and, I, and I'm sitting there, I'm going, I don't know what to do with this guy. Like, One minute, I feel like He's a messenger from heaven. And the next minute, he's, uh, this is what I thought, quote, unquote, I'm not proud of it. This is a crazy homeless guy. Next time I came back, well, I came back again, I came back again. We had lunch over the next couple of weeks a few times. The time I came, we sat down. We had lunch together. And, um, he, and he went off on some other more crazy stories about people he thought that he knew personally. And then all of a sudden, he came back. He was lucid. He said, hey, do you like music? I was like, yeah, I love music. He goes, come with me. Fanny Crosby's piano is in the other room. So he takes me and we walk into the other room and sure enough, there in this little sitting room is Fanny Crosby's piano. Fanny Crosby who wrote 8,000 hymns over her life. And he sits down and he's almost shy to touch the keys. But after a while, he sort of warms up and he starts to play, plays beautifully. And he starts to sing one of, one of Franny's songs. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And he sings through four verses and I try to sing along. His voice is beautiful. He gets to the end and he turns to me and he says, Tony, there's something broken inside of you that God wants to heal. Franny was broken. She lost her sight when she was a little girl. People told her she was cursed. And yet she knew that God loved her, and she rose above it. She went on to bless the world. There's something broken inside of you that God needs to heal, but you're not willing to receive it. And at this moment, for whatever reason, I got up and kicked my chair back, and I said, who are you to tell me anything? And I got up and I stomped out of the room. You see, I had a membrane that said that Harry was outside of who God was allowed to speak to me. He was one of the people that I determined and judged, like the Pharisee in Marianne's reading, has no right here. Quick note. I felt guilty, came back a week later, and Harry had gone back to the streets. And when I ran down the director of the shelter, he said, yeah, Harry's gone. I said, where is he? He said, he's gone. Said, How do I find him? When is he coming back? He said, once they're gone, they never come back. A couple weeks later, I got together with some friends. This is back when there were blockbusters. We went down to the blockbuster and rented a VHS. <laughs> came back and slapped the VHS into the, you know, the giant box and shakunk, turned it on, watched, watched a movie. Happened to be starring Martin Sheen and Lawrence Fishburne, Charlie Sheen. And about 20 minutes into the movie, my friend Harry wanders into the scene and plays the piano and sits down as a character in the movie.
My membranes are just false constructs that I make up so that I feel better about myself. And Peter's in the middle of it. Peter's in the middle of it. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, Peter, three men are looking for you but get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings. I have sent them myself. The Spirit has sent them himself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for, which must have been funny. Like the door flies open, he doesn't introduce himself. He just says, Behold, I'm the one. I think that's a funny scene. Okay. <laughs> Behold, I'm the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by the holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. He invited them in probably to have the lunch that everyone had been cooking from, remember back at the beginning of the story, everyone was cooking downstairs and the, by now the food was prepared. I love this part because they walk in and they basically go, yeah, the guy's a Roman, he's a centurion, but he's like the best Roman you ever heard in your entire life. Like he loves the Jews, all the Jews love him, he's devout, he keeps all the laws, he's really great. Everybody loves him. And it's like the Lord went, Peter, I know you're struggling with this thing, so I'm gonna lower the bar as low, I'm gonna make the guy as easy to like as possible because you're kind of a preschooler on this particular issue. <laughs> And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed this to you like baby food. Super easy dude. Twice in the story, if you go back to verse 2, they give his resume about how wonderful he is and how everyone loves him. In particular, all the Jews love him. Just to make sure that Peter's got no excuses to go, all right, Lord, I guess the nations can be part of your plan, starting with this guy. In my church growing up, we had a membrane mentality. And that membrane was more or less the doors of the church, the foyer of the church. Whoever, was, whoever came through those doors, whoever crossed that barrier, they were in God's plan. And everyone outside, odds are they weren't. Even if they were another church, were a little suspicious of them. And within the church, everyone sits facing the altar. In my church, there was a big cross. And that shows. And the closer you sit, Corey, my friend here, the closer you sit, the better chance you're in God's plan. You're a part of the way. And who sits right up front? The pastor. Right in the middle of God's will. Ah. Uh. I wonder if instead of thinking in a membrane mentality, what happens if we start to think in what I would call a centered mentality? And in a centered mentality, what it means is, let's go ahead and just use the cross on the stage as a metaphor. In a centered mentality, we don't ask, has somebody crossed some secret membrane, church membership, praying to receive Christ, having been baptized, having the right religious title, whatever it happens to be, being in the right tribe, being in the right cultural group, being in the right political group, whatever, the, whatever you, a membrane might be. What if we remove the membrane mentality? Instead, we think about a centering mentality. Centering just asks the question, what direction is their chair facing? Is their heart curious about the ways of God? like Cornelius. 
Do they already love many of the things that God loves, though maybe they haven't been able to have a full conversion experience yet, but they, something inside of them is looking for the thing they haven't found. And we all know that in church, there may be people who sit in the first row. Sorry, Corey. <laughs> but their chair may, in fact, be pointing the other direction. You know what I mean? Because the membrane is not what decides whether or not God loves you or calls you or wants to include you in the way. It is the direction of your heart. And the fact of the matter is we could walk out into the neighborhoods, into the highways and byways around here and meet people that maybe have never gone to church, but their chairs are pointed towards the cross. They don't know it yet. But inside, they want the things that God wants. They want to experience forgiveness. They're longing for it. And in that way, they are a part of your church. Just like Cornelius was a part of Peter's church. Peter just had a hard time seeing it. I, uh, with my shoulder blades against the stone wall, watching those beautiful peasants in that Albanian church, Danny grabbed me and he said, come outside. So we climbed out of the church and walked around to the other side. We got around to the other side. It was getting close to midnight now. And up against the wall of the, the backside of the church, Someone had pulled out a, a wooden box. And a man, as old as dust, worked his way through the cloud, crowd, a little tiny man, dressed in black. And they helped him up onto the box. And two young men stood on either side, stabilizing him. And they handed him this World War II-looking microphone and a squawk box. And this man, this little old man, a crowd of hundreds of people gathered around who had all come up the mountain from all sides from these villages who maybe had never heard a sermon before were standing there under the moonlight. And this old man began to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. The story of Easter morning, the resurrection and the hope of life, the forgiveness of sins and the kingdom to come. And he preached and he preached and he preached. And he got to the end of his sermon and he got as tall as he could get. And he said, Jesus is alive. And like three little weak voices from the audience were like, he is alive indeed, because they had never heard the phrase before. Undeterred, the old man. Jesus is alive. And this time, several dozen people were like, Jesus is alive. And he was like, and the last time, Jesus is alive, and then they yelled, he is alive indeed, at the top of their lungs, and the mountains echoed with the sound that he is alive indeed. And then the old man put down the microphone, and one of the young men handed him a candle that was lit. And he held the candle up and said, the light of Christ, the hope of the world, and he leaned down and he lit the candle of the person in the front of the crowd. And that person turned, and those people turned, and everyone had brought candles, and it spread through hundreds of people, setting to light this plateau <laughs> on top of the world in a forgotten corner in southeast Albania. And then he grabs me, Kenny grabs me, and he says, come on, this is the best part. And he and I walked to the edge of the plateau and we hung our toes over the edge. And for the next couple hours, we watched as rivers of candlelight 
went down the mountain along every path and trail into every village through the buildings because everyone wanted to take the light of Christ, the hope of the world, back to their neighborhood. And they took the candles and they put them in the front window of their house to tell all of their neighbors the light of Christ, the hope of the world. And you get to walk out of here with your candle. And all over this area are people whose chairs, they may not even know it. And if you're ready, and if you hear the Spirit's voice the way that Peter did, if you even take a chance when you're not sure you're hearing the Spirit's voice, just to bring it up. Just to bring it up. You can tell them, there was a crazy guy at church this, this Sunday. You can't believe all the stuff he talked about. Use me as a foil. I don't care. Find a reason to bring up the conversation. Because they might just have their chair oriented towards the cross and they don't know it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. going to continue in worship with, um, with another song as we just reflect on on that message and and uh, and let it continue to speak to us. So I invite you, if, if you'd like to stand or if you'd prefer to sit, um, but I invite you to, to join with us as we sing Make Room. where I lay down every burden every crown this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay down every lie and every doubt this is my surrender Let's go.
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. God, I invite you to work in my heart and to work in our hearts. That that the the walls that we've built up, that the the measuring sticks that we've created, that those are things that you would bring to light that we need to cast aside, God. Remind us that you are above all things. You know all things. You have a plan for all things, God, and your ways are so much greater than what we could plan. Let us not be hindered by by our own judgments and by our own ways of, of measuring up. But I ask that your voice would speak into us um, and help us uh, determine the path that you set aside, the people that we need to connect with, the people that we need to bring alongside God, that we wouldn't get caught up in ourselves and, and, and have hardened hearts to your plans, God, but that we would, that we would be softened, that we would be open to you that we would be quieted to hear your voice. God, um, thank you for for the words this morning. Just the reminder that um, that you have made all things new, that you have made all things clean. Help us to to treat all things as, as your creation, all people as your children. God, as we're bringing our offerings and our tithes this week, I pray that you would bless our our gifts, our talents, our time, that the things that we are doing in your name would bring you glory, would be multiplied to your will, God. We love you. and We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll close together um, with just a a song to sing in joy, um, a reminder of uh, the words from John 3.16, that God so loved the world. Let's sing together.
cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. If you can join me in the closing prayer. Father God, I, I just want to thank you for for Tony and for Amy. Um, actually, I'm going to ask, like, if you guys are near Tony and Amy, if you can just lay hands on them for a moment. Lord, being a prophet, as Tony and Amy both are, is a difficult and lonely road. But Lord, I hope that he has a sense of that he's doing your work, that you are working in him and in them and through them, um, and that you are blessing the nations. The light from that plateau has reached Port Orchard in lots of different ways, and he's one of those. Lord, I pray that you be with them, that you'd bless them, that you'd encourage them in their walk with you and the ministry that you call them to, the directions you call them to. Oh, Lord, I pray that they could uh, know and discern your voice and feel embraced by you. Uh, Lord, also his, his, his story today about this membrane mentality I was thinking about, yeah, it's, it, we do form them, we often form them, where we're in the center. And there's this membrane where we can make all the decisions, Lord. But I, I don't know, my heart is going out to the people in this room who also feel like there's a membrane. But they feel like they're sitting outside of it. That there's not a place for them in there. That if somehow people only knew what I'm dealing with or what I'm struggling with or what I've done or what's been done to me, that th there's no way I could be inside that membrane. Lord, I just pray you would destroy that in our hearts. There is no membrane with you. Let us look to you, for God so loved the world. Bless us this week, and may we be a light in this community and in our families and our workplaces and everywhere we go, Lord. Bless my brothers and sisters. In your name we pray. Amen.